um, would somebody who is new to fire like to tell me what's the type of this resource? What's it about? Not hard, really, is it? I mean, it actually says so right up there. Um, so surprising how many people don't do that. I think possibly because you don't want to be the one to stand up and get it wrong. But um, no such thing. By the way, another, another, I'm kind of going a little bit over the place. But again, within this community, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So don't be afraid to ask questions if you're not sure, um, you know, because you, it's, it's, it's surprising how often a fairly simple question has got quite a profound answer. We, we love questions. But anyway, this is, the, uh, this is a patient resource. Is this, is this an instance or is this a type? Instance, exactly. Cool. All right. Any resource instance has actually got four distinct parts to it. So the first part up here is the identity and the metadata. So this is the information about the resource instance. It's got things like its ID. So that's how to find it. It's got the type that we saw before. It's got things like when it was last updated, the version. So in Fire, there's a, there's a way of, of versioning resources. So when you, when you update something, there's a, there's a defined way of getting back to the previous versions of it. Down here, we have the text part of the resource. So this is the, we call this the lesson of CDA. One of the things that CDA did really well was it made it easy to sort of start sharing data because you could start to share just the textual information uh, and then you could go on, you could add further structured and coded data to it. And so fire has got the same thing. It's got this concept of the, of the description. We really say we don't have sort of defined rules as to exactly what should be in the text of a resource. We say that it should be clinically safe to show this to a, uh, a user and they should understand what the resource is about. But we don't go any further than that. Um, exactly how that works is up to the implementer. Then the, I'll go down to this part here. Here is the structured part of the resource. So here is where you see the patient's name, you see their gender and their birth date, and you see the values down through there. And then the fourth part is the extension, which is this part right here. So the extension, if you remember what I said earlier on, is where you add the extra bits to, uh, to a resource that aren't in the core spec. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, in just a moment when it comes to talk about profiling. But I'll call out that the extension has got a URL there. So that URL is a pointer to a description of what the extension actually is. So has anyone used version 2, version 2 Z segments? Okay. The problem with the Z segment, of course, is if you get a Z segment, you don't understand your kind of history unless you can go and find it. With Fire, this is your pointer to the description of what the resource actually means. So all resources um, have got this basic structure. I've used JSON to represent this because I do most of my development in the web space and JSON works better. But you can also represent resources in XML uh, and also in um, RDF. Um, this is not commonly used, I believe. XML and JSON are, um, are the two commonly used formats. And either works. They're, they're peers. So you can either um, you, can, you can represent it in XML or JSON. It doesn't actually matter. And you can convert between the two. Um, one thing I will say about conversion is just, just be a bit careful. There are open source tooling that you can get to convert any XML to any JSON and vice versa. Don't use those. There are uh, tooling provided by the project that you use to convert between XML and JSON. And the reason for that is, is that um, when you have an element in Fire that's defined as multiple, you can have more of, it will always be a, an array. So you can see here, again, for those who are familiar with, uh, with JSON, is that, is that this is just an array of one. So when there's, when there's um, just one name, then it's in an array of one. Um, an ordinary XML converter will convert that into an element. So uh, just watch out for that one. Right, OK, so that was resources. References between resources. So by itself, a resource is pretty boring. It doesn't tell you an awful lot because it's about a one specific thing. Life gets interesting when you start to connect them together. And the manner in which they are connected together is this concept called resources. And the example we have here is a procedure. And a procedure resource has got a reference to a patient resource with the nature of the reference being a subject. So what this is saying is that this procedure 
was done on this patient. And then we have another reference out here to the performer. So we're saying that the procedure was performed by a practitioner. So again, this is one of the key concepts in FIRE, this joining together of individual resources to tell a clinical story. Uh, and we see the encounter and the condition and so forth down through there. So to take a, give a better example of that, here's an example of a simple consultation. 12-year-old uh, boy, first consultation, complaining of pain in the right ear, uh, elevated temperature on examination, temperature of 38 degrees. I won't go through the whole thing, you can see that there. What I've done is I've color-coded the uh, parts of this clinical story with the resource that would be used to represent it. So you can see that the 12-year-old boy is a patient, that the first consultation is an encounter, that the pain in the right ear for three days is an observation, and so forth. So this concept of joining together individual resources, again, is really one of the key parts of FIRE. And part of what you know, the tooling that we're going to be looking at in just a minute uh, is intended to help understand. And you can imagine then, if you take this sort of clinical story and you represent it with, um, with these individual linked resources, you get something which looks like that. And so this is now a resource graph. So this is showing the same sort of thing. It's showing the patient down through there. There's an observation of the elevated temperature, which was done on the patient. It was done in the context of an encounter. Um, there is a diagnosis down there, which is a condition resource. Uh, the reason why it's called a condition, by the way, people tend to think of it as, uh, at least from a clinical background, it used to be a problem. But, you know, not everything is a problem, and that's a rather emotive, emotive term. So we use the word condition instead. But you can see how we have the condition uh, has a subject of the patient. It was asserted by, or the diagnosis was made by, a practitioner. So what I hope you can see from this is that there's a very fine level of granular detail in here. And you can imagine that it's, it's therefore quite possible to share this with someone else, and they will know exactly what you're talking about. But more importantly, that you can then do further analytics on this sort of level of data. You know, it, it becomes a lot easier to say, well, how often uh, does this prescription result in a, um, uh, an allergy, for example? Or, or what are the common medications that are used to prescribe uh, for a condition of otitis media? So capturing data in this sort of structured uh, format is an, is an important part, not only of recording clinical data, but the ability to share it and the ability to do other things with it. Structured and coded data. So um, there's a number of ways we can sort of represent or share information. Uh, text information is just writing a report of some sort. Uh, and then we think about structured data where you've imposed some kind of order on what's inside the data that you want to share. Uh, and then finally, we have coded data. The difference between them, text is just that text. You can't really do much else with it other than read it, unless you try to use natural language processing, which is kind of complex. Structure, we've created a slot for everything. So in a structured element, we have, for example, the patient has got their name, or they have got their gender that I've talked about, or their address. So immediately, you can dive into the data and understand it a bit better. Coded data is when we then um, refer to an external terminology when we're describing what we want to mean. So an example of that here would be the gender is a code, and it can only be one of these four values. So um, again, what we're achieving with this is the concept of semantic interoperability, the, the concept that we can be quite sure that the information we're trying to express is understood by the recipient. So it improves the quality of exchange, semantic interoperability, and it brings in this, this secondary use, these other things we can do with data. You know, it's really important in healthcare you know, to understand what's happening at the population level. But you can't ask the clinician to put data in just for that because they don't have time to do it. What you've got to do is you've got to make it so that when they're capturing data as part of their delivery of healthcare or the recording of the delivery of healthcare, it's done so in a way that enables these, uh, these secondary uses. And I put some down through there. So those are just those terms, text data versus structured versus coded data. And over here, you see the uh, definition of the uh, patient type in the specification. 
and you can see that we have each element here. We have, the, this is the cardinality, how often it can appear. That's the data type, I'll talk about that one in just a second, uh, and the description down through there. So this is what you'll see uh, if you go and take a look in the specification. Okay, data types. I glossed over it a little bit, I'll come back to it, but when you go into the spec, you'll see that each element has got a particular data type. So data types are the, if you like, the internal structure of an element. Uh, we have two different, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of information that you can put in that structured slot. And we have two sorts of, uh, of data types. The first is simple data types there. So they're things that like a date or a string or a number. Uh, and then we have complex data types. And a complex data type has got child elements inside of it. So I've given some examples over here. If we look at the human name data type, a human name can have a use. What is this name being used for? Uh, a textual representation, the family name, the given name, prefix, and so forth. And notice that each of these elements, each of these sub-elements of itself has got its own multiplicity. So a, a human name, a, a, an element which is of data type human name, can have one and only one family name. But it can have many given names. So it's important to sort of understand this, this, this concept of, of elements, elements having data types, data types having specific definitions. And the reason why we do that uh, is so that you know, we get consistency across resources. Uh, and also it makes the specification obviously quite a lot simpler to understand. You imagine that if all of these had to be present every single time we wanted to talk about a name, it would become uh, quite cumbersome very quickly. So that's the structure, that's the data types. Some of the data types are coded data types. So uh, in the previous slide I referred to the concept of coded data, where coded data returns, re refers to an external terminology like SNOMED or ICD or ICPC or any one of those things. So the, uh, we have a number of data types um, which can uh, do that kind of, um, that kind of um, uh, connection. Uh, there's the coding data type there. And we have the system, which says exactly which system is this coming from, SNOMED or ICD, version, the code itself, and so forth. So that's, that's coded data. And you can extend uh, data types as you can any other element as well if you want to add other bits. So it's very common in different um, uh, countries to have other parts of a human name. So you can add those using extensions. This is terminology. So... These are the, um, uh, the major components in FHIR uh, of, of referring to coded data. We start with the code system, which is where the, the concepts are defined. That would be SNOMED or ICD, as I've said, ICPC, RxNorm, uh, any coding system. You can actually create your own coding system if you want to, uh, although obviously it's better to uh, use existing ones if they do. And then we have this thing called a value set. And when you're dealing in fire, and particularly fire profiling, you're going to come across this value set. And the value set is a selector. So the value set is the way that you say, in this particular context of use, here are the kind of codes I expect you to see. And that's expressed by this, uh, this, this element definition here. So the element definition, let's say it's the uh, patient gender, has got a binding to a value set. And the value set says, well, here are the sort of answers that you might see in gender, and then there is the code system there. And then down here, we have the instance. We have the actual patient instance themselves. And in the instance, the value here, so this is marital status that I referred to. Marital status refers to this system there, i.e. to this code system. Uh, there's the value of it there. That's a reference to the code system. Again, I know I keep saying this important concept, but this is, is an important concept. This, th this separation between the code system or the definition of something and the value set or the selector for its use. So when you're, when you're profiling, when you're doing things with FHIR, you will very frequently be creating different value sets, but you will very commonly be using the same uh, code system. I'm sorry, oh, sorry, yes? Uh, 
The display name. This one here? So localizing is a, a another topic in and of itself. Um, I'd prefer not to go into, into details right now, but happy to talk to you about it later on. But but you're, it, it's a good point. Lo localizing um, and uh, internationalizing of this stuff is is is, is non straightforward. So not much of an answer. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. So a, I had a, I had a slide which I took out. So, and it's a really good question. So the question is about coding and codable concept. So these are both data types. Uh, the coding is the uh, the base data type which lets you refer to an external terminology. So that's why it has the, the system, which identifies the code system, and it has the code uh, in the code system, and the display, which is actually the um, display from the code system. The codable concept is like a next level up, and a codable concept contains any number of codings, uh, and it also has a text element in it. And the, you'll actually see codable concept more frequently than coding. And the reason for that is, is to allow you to express the same thing in different, um, different code systems. So, for example, you might have a condition code. And you might have the SNOMED representation of that condition code. But you might also want to put it, be able to put it in ICD. So a codable concept allows you to say, I have this diagnosis. This diagnosis in SNOMED has got that value. If it was ICD, it would have this other value. It's not the same as internationalization because it's the same thing that you're talking about. But that's what the codable concept is. So the concept is the same as It's wrappers perhaps not the best way of doing it. One thing I kind of glossed over a little bit, uh, and I don't think I've got an example. Yes, I do have an example. Here we go. If we look at the human name data type, the human name <coughs> data type can actually include other complicated, complex data types. So the human name has got these simple data types and then this complex data type. If I had a, a codable concept up here, what you would see is the codable concept has got a sub-element called coding, which is a type coding. So that's how that works. So it's, it's really more of a compositional thing than a wrapping thing. No worries. And thanks for the questions. It's always <coughs> nice to, uh, to believe that people are, are still awake. Um, right, OK, so that was the background stuff. Um, I'm now going to talk about ClinFire. So has anyone come across ClinFire, incidentally? No, nope. one person. That's good. Hopefully a little bit more after this. Uh, so ClinFire is a tool that we developed for clinician education. Uh, so it kind of came about because as Fire was starting to become developed with an HL7, the techies got it. So the techies could understand what we were talking about. But the clinical folk who, who made up a lot of the composition of the committees, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to throw XML and JSON fragments at them and say, well, this is what we're talking about. So we started to develop ClinFire as a way of showing of representing some of these relationships in, a, in an easy to understand form. Um, since then, people have started to use it not only for education, but also for doing design type work, as I'll show you uh, in just a second. It's a web based app, it's free to use, it's on the web. Um, we'll be looking at it uh, in the next section. In fact, there's the um, URL to it there. As I say, free to use, always be free to use, absolute guarantee of that. You know, you, I'm never going to put my hand out and ask for money. Well, actually, maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, certainly it's, it's always going to be free to use. It's actively developed, which is kind of like shorthand for saying it changes quite a lot. Uh, and the modules I'm going to talk about today are three of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about the patient viewer, which is how you look at patient data. I'm going to talk about the graph builder, which is building those graphs that we saw before, like with that um, uh, consultation. And I'm going to look at the lo talk about the logical modeler, which is how you take a uh, core resource and you add and change it to meet your needs. 
I will point out, I think I point out elsewhere, um, it's, it, it's a design and it's an educational tool. So it's not intended to produce the actual artifacts needed for profiling. You know, things like Forge and such like will do that. So as I say, its place is in an educational space. ClinFire has got the concept of um, different data, different servers. So it has the concept of a data server, which is where information actually sits. It has the concept of a conformance server, which is where the definitions sit. So that's the uh, what's inside of a patient, um, or um, you know what's a, what is a condition. Uh, what are the what are the uh, other resources that a condition can link to, can reference to that kind of stuff. And all the profiles sit in there as well. And then finally, it has this concept of a terminology server. So the terminology server is which the one that understands what value sets are, what code systems are, and so forth. Um, and the reason for doing that was to reflect the concept of an ecosystem, reflect the concept of the idea that we're not going to have data all in one place. It's going to be in sort of different places, um, and we need different ways of understanding that. Um, and they can all be the same server if they need to be, uh, and that's where you set them. I'll show you this in just a second. So, so I'm going to talk about first... So as I said, this session is going to be just PowerPoints, and the next session we'll actually do this for real. But So I'm going to talk first about the Graph Builder. Uh, and the Graph Builder lets you construct these, uh, these graphs of resources, often to show a scenario, as I did before, but not always. You can use this if you, say, want to just you know, quickly sketch together how three or four resources might link together. This is the overall process of, of, um, of getting into the Graph Builder. Uh, you start the ClinFire application. You select the Graph Viewer application, uh, you select the event, and then you, you create your graph. Again, we'll look at all of this uh, in detail in the next section. And then once you've created your graph, you can then add resources to it, add data to those resources, link them together, save them to a fire server, do all that kind of stuff. And there are different views for doing that. Um, doesn't really have an awful lot to do with, uh, with, with uh, what I'm talking about, but it is a patient and it did kind of, um, kind of um, uh, make me smile a wee bit. I've had to wear a gown like that. I'm not sure who is. I had underwear on, by the way, when I was wearing a gown like that, fortunately. Um, so most graphs have got a patient. Uh, you should really only have one patient in your graph. There's nothing stopping you having more than one if you, if you are trying to express something to multiple patients, but most of the time you'll just have a single graph. You can, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, a single patient. You can create a new patient within your graph if you want to, or you can link to an existing patient if you're wanting to, say, show a graph from data that already exists on a fire server. You can link to existing patients and then link to all of their resources as well when you are creating your graph. Um, and then, then you can save that to the server. So this is, uh, this is a picture now of, uh, of the graph builder showing a fairly simple graph down through there that's been built. It's a problem list which has um, links to conditions. Does that mean, oh shivers, okay, I'm going a bit slow. Um, so uh, I, I need to speed up my delivery. So this is showing, this is the list of graphs uh, that we've got, you can have more than one. This particular graph, there are the servers, what it's trying to do. Um, these are where you select your uh, resources. Again, we'll look at this in detail in the next section. Uh, I just wanted to show here is, here is the list of elements inside a particular resource. In this case, it's a condition resource. Uh, and you can see there's the codable concept, for example, representing um, a verification status. This is what it looks like on the wire. This is all built automatically through a graphical interface. Um, here is where we're saving it to a server. So we've created these, uh, these individual resources here. The save to server will send those resources up to the server and save them on the server. That's just uh, showing the saver. I took hours doing all these cute little animations. It just, just simply isn't fair. OK, the uh, uh, patient viewer then allows us to view that uh, data. The data does not have to come from the graph builder. This works against any um, fire server. Uh, there's the process down through there. These slides will be available, by the way, if you want to do them. And again, I emphasize we're going to look at this in, a, in just a minute. Uh, but here is an example of what we now see. So this is a patient. There are the uh, resource types for this patient. There are the instances of this particular type, the medication list, and here are the different views that we've got 
uh, the uh, references from this list, the medication statement, uh, a reference to the patient and so forth. Again, the idea here trying to show you, you know, how you actually join these resources together to do something more useful. Right, profiling. I'm just going to move away from ClinFire for a second and talk about profiling. Profiling is a big, big topic. But fundamentally, what it's doing is it's trying to address this problem. We have lots of different contexts in healthcare, lots of, you know, lots of different ways that we want to share a patient to a different levels of, um, of data. But we only want one patient resource. We don't want more than one. So profiling is about adapting the resources to meet a, a particular need. And as you can see, to do so in a structured way, in a way that's discoverable. And so you can sort of think of it like this. You start with your base specification, you profile it to meet your particular needs, uh, and then out of that profile you build an implementation guide. So they're, they're the key things that you, that you do as you are profiling. And there's three main aspects to profiling. It gets, it gets a lot more complicated than this, but fundamentally there's three things that you are doing. You are constraining a resource by removing elements that you don't need. Uh, you are changing binding. The binding, this is where this um, value set comes in. That's why value sets are so important to understand. Uh, and you add new elements um, as an extension. Uh, I'll flip past some of these, but here's an example. So we take a patient resource over there. So we might want to require that the, uh, the, the patient has a national identifier and it's required. So we're saying, I've got an identifier, it's got to be a national identifier, you've got to have at least one of them. You might want to limit names. So the fire uh, spec says that a patient can have more than, one, more than one name. You might want to say, no, they can only have one name. There's changing of the value set. So the marital status in fire is defined to be a particular set of values, but in your country you have a different set of values. You might take out photo because we simply don't support photo. Uh, again, I don't want to go into too many details. Actually taking stuff out, we probably we, we, these days we tend to say you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, we have slightly different concepts of, of doing that, but it's technically feasible. If you're interested in profiling, check the, um, uh, check the program because there are um, uh, presentations here from people on profiling in some detail. And then finally... Uh, you can add an extension to do to support something else like ethnicity. Extensions. Extensions are normal. I can't overemphasize this. Our expectation is that any real implementation will have extensions. Uh, and the extension in the instance, and you may remember I referred to that, uh, we had the patient example before, there's a URL report that points to its definition. So the idea of it is, is that if you get a resource and that resource has got an extension, you can always find out what that extension actually means. Um, am I over time? Uh, I, think, I think I am, but I haven't seen my five minutes. All right, I'm going to carry on talking. Um, oh. Just round up. Uh, okay, just round up. All right. Okay, so um, at extensions... I think what I'll do is I might stop at this point and I'll just finish off this bit. Oh no, I'll round it really quickly, really quickly, uh, I promise. Uh, so the logical modeler is the one that lets you do this, uh, this kind of um, uh, adaption. Uh, here's an example of a logical modeler. There's a practitioner, there's the gender. Uh, again, it breaks my heart to flip through all of these things, but these are, these are where you're saying, um, you know, what's the description, uh, what's the value set, uh, if it's an extension down through there. That's how I add it to, I'll go through this. Uh, here's a way you could do stuff. More information. Okay, there we go. That's a quick roundup. So I'm sorry I had to <laughs> rush it at the end. Um, uh, so uh, thanks for coming. I'm happy to stay and take any further questions. And as I say, we'll do this for real in the next session. Thank you.